mathematical symbols. Ever since the dawn of human civilization, we have seen the usage of different mathematical symbols, signs and anagrams, which are found engraved in pillars, caves, tablets, and on different stones. If we go back to the ancient Greek, Mesopotamian and Sumerian civilization, we find the usage of different types of symbols. As with the advancement of human civilization, these mathematical symbols are later being used in science, astronomy, astrophysics, and different branches. Welcome to my channel, Physics for Students. My name is Shaunak, and I welcome you to your fresh new series of lectures on discovering mathematical symbols. In this due process of this lecture, what I'm going to do is that we are going to dig and we are going to find what was the origin of these mathematical symbols, who discovered those symbols, or we can also find out the civilization which was responsible in discovering those symbols. In due course of time, we will also find out how these symbols are being used. Is it that plus and minus and subtraction and division is only being used in the general sense or they have higher and better uses in advanced mathematics? My request to all of you is that in due process of time, we will also find out that we are not you know, using the general field of mathematics, but we have to go and learn certain advanced field of mathematics, which includes number theory, Galois theorem, group theory, category theory, and further on. Because I would really like to show you that apart from the general notion of those symbols, what are the other areas in mathematics and how they are being used. So just stay tuned and just be ready to plunge into the uh, adventure of discovering mathematical symbols, going back to the past, discovering the past and knowing the real reason, the person and the civilization responsible for developing these mathematical symbols. So first we look forward the basic symbol of arithmetic operation which is the addition. Now the symbols as we know we go back to the ancient Greeks but the Greeks use this uh, symbols not for addition, subtraction, division and multiplication but they were used for esoteric cult symbols about combining of the feminine with the masculine. Uh, you can state it in another way that it is combining a masculine god with a feminine goddess. So the, this Hansen belief was tied up with the religious philosophy that a mortal human woman could become a goddess and a mortal human man could become a god through a process of magical transformation. So the ancient Egyptians using the esoteric cult symbols and uh, they used to worship the mathematics which you have seen earlier in my videos where I have spoken about the Pythagorean argument that numbers were independent of reality and numbers were worshipped uh, as god and goddesses. Now history dates back to one of the influential French philosopher of the later Middle Ages, Nicole Orison or Nicolas Orison. Uh, well, not much is known about his family. He studied arts in Paris and was born in Normandy. In 1348, he was a student of theology in Paris and in 1356, he received his doctorate. So here, right on your screen, I've just given you basic uh, few points on Nicole Orson, uh, economics, mathematics, physics, and astrology teacher, and he was a counselor of King Charles V of France. The later part, we find one important book of Orson, Allegorismus Proportionum, believing to have written between 1356 and 1361, and here we first find the usage of plus. The symbol appears in manuscript of this work which is believed to have been you know, written in the 4th and 14th century but perhaps by a copist and not by Orson himself. Now this usage of the plus sign was used by the Latin word et or et which means and. And as you see that Orson used the word et that signifies sum or addition in the following lines. To be very honest with my poor Latin, I won't go forward in reading this line. But those who are aware about Latin, you can go forward and read this line. As you can see, he used this word for, et, three, et, primi, numeri, and so on. So this book, very important in our learning of history, that the first usage of plus, which is used as et, 
which means addition. Johannes Waldman or Johannes Widman uh, was a German mathematician who is best remembered for an early arithmetic book which contains the first appearance of plus and minus signs. Johannes Widman, uh, whose or name is also written as Weidman, attended the University of Leipzig and his name appears on the list of those registered for the winter semester of 1480 as Johannes Widman de Egra. He graduated with a first degree in 1482 and he continued to study for a master's degree being allowed to live outside the dormitory. His master's degree was awarded in 1485 and then he taught at the University of Leipzig on the fundamentals of arithmetic, computation of lines and algebra. His lectures were advertised and students were invited to attend. So you see, I've just given a few points. He was a German mathematician teaching University of Leipzig and what are the essential areas that he taught. Now, Widman's 1486 algebra lecture was the first to be given in Germany on that topic and amazingly, it still survives a notebook of the student who attend. The name of the book, I won't dare to pronounce it. It is in German. This is basically the book. Uh, it is an early arithmetic book, Behend und Hupsche, whatever be. Uh, I would uh, be very wrong if I pronounce it with a wrong grammar or a wrong uh, German pronunciation, which is more or less, if it is translated in English, uh, it means nimble and pretty account on all merchants. It was published in German in 1489 and that Widman was best remembered. This book has become famous since it contained the first appearance of the plus and minus signs for addition and subtraction. Now, as you can see, this is the cover of the early book and Widman actually, the yeah, so you see this, this is the picture of the book which I have taken, the first page of Widman uh, and the name of the title of the book. Most importantly, this is actually one of the excerpt of the book and in here Widman wrote this in German, right? So four centener plus five, whatever it is, it, uh, it you can more or less understand it shows the excess or deficiency in the weight of boxes or bales. So as because it was merchant and it was related to trading, so it signified the excess or deficiency in the weight of boxes. Now here I would like to draw your attention to another famous historian, Florian Kajori, the famous Swiss American historian mathematician. And he said, there is a clear evidence that as a lecturer at the University of Leipzig, Widman had studied manuscripts in the Dresden library in which plus and minus signify operations, some of these having been written as early as 1486. Right. So, Kajori, uh, who is known, you all know, for his famous book on uh, m discovering the history of mathematical symbols, he says that he studied in the Dresden library in which the plus and minus signify operations and it is risen, written as early as 1486. So, let us look now into the usage of the uh, symbols other than 3 plus 2, 5, which we all know. It is actually used what is meant by disjoint union. So you get a U sign with a plus at the middle and this is the usual sign of a disjoint union. Now if I go forward and explain to you what is a disjoint union, we get a set A equals to 3 and 4, B equals to 11 and 14 and we try to join it like uh, we add up all the elements of the set A and set B but we do a disjoint. So that is how it is called the disjoint union. Furthermore, it can be also used if you take a kind of a set, for example, these are the elements of A and B, C, D, E, then what we do is that we do a multi-set union. That means we are adding both the uh, two of A's, two of B's, C, followed by the union and a plus sign and C and two of D and E, two of E, which results into this, A2, B2, C2, D2 and E2. Right. So we are doing a multi-set union. We are adding up and here also the plus sign is being used inside a big U. 
In computer language, this is used, plus sign is used A plus equals to B, which means A equal to A plus B and A equal to plus B, which means A equals to B. And if I use A plus plus, it means a postfix increment, which means returning the value before incrementing and plus plus A, which means prefix increment, that means returning the value after incrementing. So more or less it is clear that this uh, plus plus signifies before and plus uh, after and this is uh, before. So it is uh, the value before incrementing and minus incrementing. And the computer language I have shown that what does it mean? I'm not sure it might be Java or it might be Python that but it, it is used in computer language. So the same plus sign how it is being used in different ways. So we come to subtraction, uh, which is the second operation, uh, arithmetic operators. So we all know about this. So this is very funny to look upon. But what we can do is that if we get a set uh, A, which contains those elements and set B, then we can subtract the set from one of the other. So we include the first because one is not included in B. We take two. No, we cannot take two because it is included in B. We take three because it is not included. Then we discard four because it is included in A and B. And then we take five, which is included only in B. So this in, in, uh, signifies the subtraction of the sets. So we say the elements of A which are not in the set B. The elements of set A which are not in B. Now we also know what is called an additive inverse that means it yields to zero. So whatever added with the negative one would yield to zero. But if we see a wonderful thing that once we use this in complex numbers minus a plus b this and we try to plot it on a complex plane it gives a totally a kind of a 365 degree a different kind of a curvature or just different kind of a figure in the complex plane so this shows that how we can use the additive inverse or the usage of the plus sign in a complex plane or complex numbers which gives a different kind of a complex plane well, uh, something we come across which is called a relative complement in set theory. Now, let me just tell you what is this, that if A and B, for example, are different sets, then the relative complement of A in B is also uh, termed as the set difference of B and A. So, we get B minus A is the set elements. But hold on, hold on. The relative complement of A in B is this one is a little bit ambiguous. So if you find this term, think twice whether you should consider it to be right or not because this leads to, yes, the question mark. However, the right symbol is this one, right, with a slash, right? So this, this is something you need to be uh, very uh, careful. So the relative component of A in B is denoted by the green sign, which I have shown with a tick, right, is sometimes written uh, with an uh, ambiguous term which I have already shown as in some context it can be interpreted as a set of all elements B minus A where B is taken from where B is taken from uh, I mean just a small b is taken from capital B and small a is taken from capital A. There is also something at the bottom of your screen which is called a Minkowski difference However, I'm not going to go ahead and uh, explain much on this particular subject, but just note that minus sign is also being used in complement set theory, which can be ambiguous, but it is very much used in Minkowski difference. We come across the uh, s next uh, uh, symbol in arithmetic, which is called multiplication. Now, multiplication has got a wonderful history, which I would like to tell you. Now here is a person, uh, you know, he is born in the year 1574, named as William Outend, an English mathematician who is best known for his invention of an early form of the slide rule, which is used in alg uh, logarithm, and he invented many new symbols, including the uh, multiplication x uh, symbol and the proportion. Now, William Outrend's father was the Reverend Benjamin Outrend, a writing master and registrar at Eton College. We have given William's date of birth, as you see, 5th of March, 1574, but some of the biographies give this date as his date of birth, but in fact, is the date when he was baptized. So, his actual date of birth 
is known but is unlikely to be more than a few days before his date of baptism. William attended Eton School as a King Scholar which although a very famous school was in fact his local school, the school where his father taught. William was taught arithmetic at Eton by his own father. William Outen's most important work is Clavis Mathematica, The Key to Mathematics, which was published in 1631. This is a textbook on elementary algebra. He experimented with many new symbols including multiplication and proportion. Outrend also invented freely with symbols introducing not only the multiplication sign which is now used universally but also the proportional sign uh, which is the double colon and this book became popular around 15 years later as mathematics took a greater role in higher education. Given this background of William Outren, let us see that what are the other usage of this cross multiplication sign. So a cross product, first of all, it is a binary operation on two vectors in three dimensional space. It results in a vector that is perpendicular to both the vectors. Now you see this A and B, once I put a cross product, it looks like this. And if A and B multiplied produces another vector C, which should be perpendicular to each other. And I have shown it in black so that you can understand. And it is the value should be sine theta. So there are other various notations, I would say various implications and detailed understanding of a cross product, but that is beyond the uh, scope of this video. We also say what is called the Cartesian product of sets where I have just taken abrupt A is equals to egg and chicken and B is a set of sausage and chips. And when you do a Cartesian product, you get egg, sausage, egg and chips and chicken and sausage and chicken and chips. So what we get is something like this. So it is typically a Cartesian product of sets. You see the multiplication sign between the two matrices. Now hold on, you might also ask me that why this multiplication sign can there not be a dot sign yes definitely later on in linear algebra we get a dot sign but in case of elementary linear algebra in matrix multiplication we use this sign so it is worth mentioning it is also used in matrix multiplication like this and it is used in geometric dimension for example 10 by 10 fit house or a room or to mention the resolution of your, the computer screen or a laptop screen or your television we use 1200 uh, pixels by 900 pixels or 20 pixels by 50 pixels and so in all it, uh, it mentions what is called a geometric dimension. Now here is something very interesting. What is called a direct product of groups. Now hold on. I'll just like to mention in a few words so that you can really enjoy the beauty behind that. Now in mathematics what happens specifically in group theory. The direct product is an operation of two groups. So just for the time being let us not go into the details of group theory. Let us understand there are two groups G and H which constructs a new group denoted by this right g multiplied by s this operation is somehow a group theoretic analog of the cartesian product of sets and it is one of the several important not notions of direct product in mathematics now the direct product is defined for a number of classes so you see this is a direct product of objects already known producing a new one it is an operation it takes two groups and produces a new group right so in case in each case the direct product of an uh, of an algebraic object is given by cartesian products of its elements considered its sets and its algebraic operations are defined component wise so direct product is another important where the multiplication and is used another important is using it in category theory producing a product category just a few lines you will be able to understand what is category now a category actually describes the essence of objects right so category theory assumes that we can determine essence by knowing the relationship among objects so I want to emphasize so it is an extension of the Cartesian product of two sets so what I want to emphasize that we don't actually care about the nature of the objects themselves we only care about relationships so objects matter so little in category theory that we often just call them things 
However, we give all sorts of names to the relationships, something like monads, monoids and groupoids and so on. So the general guiding principle in category theory though is what is important is not what an object is, right? It is not important what an object is but rather what it does, how it behaves relative to other objects in terms of morphism. So these words describe different kinds of categories if you think of them as different classifications of relationships between things. So in mathematics, a field of category theory, we take two categories C and D denoted by this and it product of two categories C and D is denoted by so on. So this is another important usage of multiplication sign in category theory. We come to the next arithmetic operator which is called a dot. Now most importantly what I called dot depends on where it is used, the meaning. First of all, if I use it right at the bottom of two numbers, it means decimal points, right? 2.3 and so on. If it is used right at the middle, it is used for multiplication. And we know, all know that is being uh, defined by uh, Leibniz. If we use it right on the top of the variable, we called it the first derivative and it is being invented by Sir Isaac Newton. So depending upon the point, depending upon the position of the point, the meaning of the dot changes. Now here is a note again from Kajuri's book, very important and interesting, that Leibniz on July 29, 1698 wrote a letter to Johann Bernoulli, another great mathematician, that I do not like the cross as a symbol for multiplication as it is easily confounded with x, that means it gets complicated. Often I simply relate two quantities by an interposed dot and indicate multiplication by this one. If you read further to this paragraph, you will sign that it has been stated that the dot was used as a symbol for multiplication before Leibniz that Thomas Harriot in his this book used the dot in the expression so on. So this is just an interesting historical uh, note that how Leibniz wrote to Bernoulli mentioning that he is getting confused using the cross and instead of that he used a dot sign. Now this dot is also used to denote what is called a dot product. I'm not going to define or go further details in what is a dot product but algebraically the dot product is defined as the sum of the products of the corresponding entries of two sequence of numbers and geometrically it is the product of the two vectors uh, of Euclidean magnitudes and the cosine of the angle between them. So both the definitions are equivalent when working with Cartesian coordinates. However, the dot product of two vectors is the product of the magnitude of the two vectors and the cos of the angle between them. In mathematics, the dot product or scalar product is an algebraic operation that takes two equal length sequence of numbers and returns a single number. So right on your screen, I have given two notations of dot product. I have used a circle marked in red so that you can understand that the usage of the dot sign in terms of dot product, both of these means dot product. Now here is a note of attention. Often on you will see that the dot product which is just a single dot can be get you get confused with this one. Now this is not a dot product. If you are aware about using Microsoft Word and using the symbols in Microsoft or, or you are using LaTeX symbol this is different. This is called a composite function. To be, to be on simple words, a function that is written within another function is called a composite function. So that dot, which is just a single dot, a point, uh, a, a just, a just a small one, is should not be confused with a composite function. Let me give you a very quick and a simple example how to understand a composite function. So let us assume that x is the flower. We are making bread, right? It's nice winter season still here. So we are making bread. So let x is the flower. The food processor is doing the function of preparing the dough of, you know, making the flour and we call it gx and let the oven which is f of x or x makes the function of making the bread, right? So in order to prepare bread, the output is this one, right? So g of x should be placed in the function of f of x. That means 
what that it the the prepared dough should be placed in the oven the result is denoted by this and i have marked this in red so that you understand that this is a composite functions of g of x using flour getting processed into oven and producing the final result through a composite function which is a nice tasty bread so we come to the next part of um, arithmetic operator which is very common which is called a plus minus now in experimental science we all know that 40 plus minus 5 actually means the range should be between 35 and 45 right you know it is it's quite simple so it defines a range and the margin of error and if we take a ruler and we mark something like this so it means that the margin of error should be between say 5.5 and 8.5 right so we sh uh, show a figure on the right hand side of your screen and this is the value so the value could be between six and a half and seven and a half right so this is plus minus 0 0.5 so we say that the error margin can be something between plus minus 0 0.5 so this is the usage of plus minus in experimental science now we all know that if we get a square root or a quadratic equation it means that we will use both the positive and the negative sign in order to get the result of that equation so square root of 256 means we get a positive 16 and we get a negative 16 so uh, that is the usage of a square root this is something very interesting now in medicinal terms a doctor usage this word right it is not a very good thing but anyway just as an as an a citing as an example so in medicinal terms if you use this what does it mean if you translate it it says acute renal failure that means a kidney failure due to congestive heart failure possibly excavated or made worse by the excavated isn't a medical term chronic obstructive pulmonary disease maybe chronic bronchitis but probably emphysema if either so what I'm trying to tell you is that if you see that the doctor is using the plus minus sign in medicinal terms, it means that it is more or less this or it is coming close to that. Now in chemistry, it is used, this plus minus signs is also used. Now here is a new, uh, it is something uh, very new for me. It is called, uh, it, it, this is a term which is called a racemic mixture. It is a 50-50 mixture of uh, of two N of, N of, this is called N of, N of Timus, right the enatimuzers are a race uh, their racemic mixtures were an interesting experimental discovery between two optically active samples which can be combined in a one is to one ratio to create an optically inactive sample so i'm not going to be very honest i'm not the right person to tell about racemic mixture but here is the plus minus sign used in chemistry so just to give you an idea in engineering if we go forward and we understand there is a concept called tolerance which also says say for example this kind of a figure on your left hand side so what does that mean it means a five millimeter tolerance the value should be plus or minus five millimeters so our value 125 millimeter has any range between 125 and 30 and we say 125 mm plus minus 5 mm so the concept of tolerance means the range of values in which a measurement is acceptable so it can be anything it can be measurement problems it can be anything which will come more clearer in the next uh, in the next few seconds so engineering tolerance is this now in statistics for probability and standard deviation we use this plus minus sign right so plus minus 5.7 plus minus means it can be anything between 5.5 and 2 5.5 to 5.9 inclusive of that now here is a concept which is called propagation of uncertainty now in statistics propagation of uncertainty is the effect of variables or uncertainties i would say on the uncertainty of a function based on them now when the variable are the values of experimental measurements right we are experimenting something they have uncertainties due to lot of reasons temperature air pressure measurement limitations instrument precision and this which propagates due to the combination of variables in the function this is what we call propagation of uncertainty so you see the effect of variables uncertain on the uncertainty function x is plus minus 
mu or whatever so approximately one standard deviation from sigma from the central value it is roughly around this case so in standard deviation as well as in propagation you will see more in quantum mechanics when we use this that there is an uncertainty principle plus minus due to several external extraneous factors So there is another one which is called negative plus, plus minus and minus plus. So it means that the negative value is to be taken. I have written that used pair with plus minus denotes the opposite sign. That means if there is a plus, if plus minus, we take the negative and minus if plus minus, then we take the positive. So we come to another interesting arithmetic operator which is called the division. Now, this has got a very interesting, uh, you know, history. Now, this word, I will explain to you, the person who is uh, shown on the left. This word, the word obelus, actually comes from the Greek word obelos. Uh, uh, for sharpened it means stick or split or pointed, right? So, this has the same root as you understand of the word obelisk which means uh, you know church we see obelisk right so the form of the obelisk as a horizontal line with a dot above and a dot below and was first used as a symbol for division by this swiss mathematician johann Rahn in his book Teutsch algebra which was published in 1659 right at your bottom i've given a small picture of this book and this gave rise to the ma modern mathematical symbol. Johann Rahn was actually was a Swiss mathematician who is credited with the first use of the division sign. A pre it is uh, supposed to be an obelus variant and therefore a sign and a therefore sign. The symbols used in Teutsch algebra published in 1659. Now, another mathematician, John Pell, collaborated with Rahn in this book which contains an example of the Pale equation. It is uncertain whether Ron or Pell was responsible for introducing the symbols. That means there is still, and you know history is full of uh, problems and full of different kinds of opinions. And in this case, the uh, obelus sign of Ron and Pell is also not an exception. I'm not going to you know, cover up much about division because division sign is used mostly in case of only division. Now, colon. Now, this is something important. This is an exception. This is not a mathematical sign. This is a punctuation mark. That means in due course of dialects of talking and uh, giving intervals while talking, this punctuation mark colon is being used. So it comes from Latin cola, which is a verse or a poem and Greek limbo member. It has been used for various ways. Few examples. So they are in front of you. I have three brothers followed by a colon. The party starts followed by a time it is used in uh, in in quran and in bible as well as uh, in gregorian chants now this is one symbol uh, i would say an excerpt from the 15th century bible text in Giz, which says and you can see vividly that the script showing colons how they're used between the words now this is something very interesting now i have taken this though source from harvard university and it means punctus elevatus now you should understand that both colon and semicolon were featured in the gregorian chants that means in uh, in church or even in op operas where the uh, sopranos singers were there there were usage of colon that means you have to pause right with the form as punctus elevatus which means an elevated point and the semicolon was used as punctus versus which means a long pause right it was first proposed by aristophanes and eventually faded away so the first usage of the colon dates back to 1600s to denote a pause time greater than comma but less than full stop so it is a pause which is greater than comma but less than full stop so it is uh, basically a punctuation sign which later was used in mathematics it's a very important point now it is used to denote ratio of two quantities the word ratio comes from the greek word logos which means reason so nothing great to explain two is to three and five is to six is to seven the same thing is used in colon is used in function so you can see a function this one which means a set x to a set y is an assignment of an element of y to each element of x right so the set is called the domain of the function and the set y is called the codomain of function 
and in group theory it is used as an index of subgroup g colon h followed by two horizontal bars and the square bracket and the braces i'm not going to explain further in group theory but just understand that this is the colon is also used here in set theory, if we get this kind of a notation where the colon is being used, it means the set of all x such that x is greater than 0, right? So this colon is used in uh, what we call this kind of a notation, which is called the set builder notation. But remember that this colon is sometimes replaced by a piping sign, a horizontal bar. That is also means such that. And if you get this kind of an expression, it means real numbers such that whatever the condition greater than 3 or less than. So in set theory also colon is being used. Slash. The origin of slash go back to a Muslim mathematician from Morocco, Al Hasr or Abu Bakr. A uh, mathematician Morocco living in the 12th century, Al Hasr developed the modern mathematical symbol notation for fractions. Obviously, the fractions are denoted by slash, where the numerator and denominator are separated by a horizontal bar. The same uh, fractional notation appeared soon after in the work of Fibonacci in the 13th century. So these are the two names, a book of demonstration and memorization and complete book on the arts of numbers. Names are in Arabic. So these are the two important books of al hasr and he is considered to be the founder of the slash sign. Fraction, obviously it is before you, I have just given a small pizza example to understand things easier. It is used in fraction 5 by 7 and in division also. Now here is an important uh, point. This slash sign is also used in what is called a quotient set. I will just tell you a quotient set of a set is informally a new set obtained by identifying some elements of the original set. It is written something like this s by or upon 3 and in quotient category also it is used using uh, what is called morphism. Right. Now you might at this point think that what is a quotient set or what is a quotient category. Although this video uh, uh, sticks to the basic point that is understanding the origin of the symbols but definitely it is a good point to understand what is a quotient set. I will just go back and make you understand what is an equivalence class first. Now you see this figure it is uh, two triangles which are congruent to each other and these two triangles are not congruent to each other right and we call them the element of some set S which have a notion of equivalence it gets split into equivalence classes and this equivalence is denoted by the equivalence sign you all know and this equivalence classes form a partition I mean to say partition means it is grouping of elements this partition that is a set of equivalence classes is called quotient set or quotient space and is denoted by this one which includes a slash sign introduced by Al Hasr or Abu Bakr. Now I would like to explain you in easy term now for example so these elements have a notion of equivalence you have seen that one may naturally split into others and these equivalence construct the elements now for, for example we set capital C as a set of all cars okay and this one tilde C is an equivalence we all know that that means say for example it is of the same color okay so for some white car which is w and some for other white car which is h we denote this as this one okay w which has got an equivalence in relation with the another class h so with that kind of an equivalence relation we get w it works well because it means the equivalence class right and is the partition since both w and h are in the same equivalence class we can write this so the quotient uh, this one which you are using for the equivalence quotient set would be a set of all equivalence classes in c under this one sign tilde c it is the set of all partitions partitioned by color so i think that gives you a basic understanding what do i mean by quotient uh, uh, quotient space and quotient set and what what i tried to uh, explain to you earlier now this slash sign is also used in something which is called a Galois group. Now those who are aware about number theory in mathematics in the area of abstract algebra there is a Galois theory. The Galois group of a certain type of field extension is a specific group associated with the field extension. So suppose that E is an extension of the field F it is written as this 
and E upon F forms a group with the operation of function of composition. It is also called a Galois group. And on the right hand side, I have given what do we mean by field extension, although again it goes much more into details. So, so study of field extension and their relationship to the polynomials that give rise to them via Galois group is called Galois theory, which I'm not going to explain. And it is named in honor of a very young extremely talented but a very unfortunate young mathematician Eversti Galois. So uh, we come to something which we all know so it is called square root but this square root has got a very interesting history. Now we all know about what is called this Rhine mathematical papyrus. So this Rhine papyrus is a famous document from the Egypt, uh, Egyptian Middle Kingdom and it dates around say 1800 1650 BC and it was purchased by Henry Rhine in Egypt in 1858 and placed in the British Museum. Now this why uh, then we come to what we call is called Yale Babylonian uh, uh, collection. You see this YBC from the Yale Babylonian collection it is a hand tablet and it appears to be a practice school exercise which was do, which was being done during that time by a novice scribe right such an interesting it's maybe a novice was just scribing on that and putting up some something interesting but mathematically speaking this second millennium BCE document is one of the most fascinating extant clay tablets because it contains not only a constructed illustration of a geometric square with intersecting diagonals but it is also in its text a numerical estimate of square root of 2 corrected to 3 sexagesimal or 6 decimal places. Now the value is read from the uppermost horizontal if you can see the uh, the picture on the left hand side horizontal inscription and demonstrates the greatest known computational accuracy obtained anywhere in the ancient world. It is believed that the tablet's author copied the results from an existing tablet of values and did not compute them themselves. So whatever this is this is something really interesting about the Yale Babylonian collection and the value of square root of 2. But hold on it is not the oldest one. Here we come back to India. Bodhyayana, uh, well, he was uh, basically a Vedic priest. Now, first of all, let me tell you Bodhyayana's sutras or Sulba sutras. This one I'm going to explain to you later. But first of all, let us understand that the geometry during that time, which is quite old, was done by constructing fire altars. So all the holy rituals and the yagyas uh, during that Vedic period was being done on fire altar. So Bodhyanyana is said to be the original mathematician behind the Pythagoras' theorem, right? I'm not going into further argument, but Pythagoras' theorem was indeed known much before Pythagoras and almost thousand years before Pythagoras was born. So it is widely believed that he was a priest and an architect of very high standards. It is possible that Bodhyana's interest in mathematical calculation stemmed more from his work in religious matters than his keenness in mathematics. So undoubtedly he wrote the Shulba Sutras. So Sutras means the text okay, to provide rules for religious rites and it would appear almost certain that Bodhyayana obviously was a Vedic priest. The Shulba Sutras is like a guide to the Vedas which formulates which I told right on the first um, um, if you see on the screen that it rules of constructing altars and thereby it teaches the mathematics very easily. So the value of square root of 2, it is done by Bodhyayana and one of his disciple Apashtamba and Katayana. It is written in Sanskrit. Uh, you can read it out. It says Pramanam Tritiyena Vardhyet. That means the third part Vardhyet means to increase. And Katayana further says Karani Tritiyena Vardhyet Tattva. So if I translate it in English, it comes something like this. Increase the measure by its third part and this third by its own fourth part, less than 34th part of that fourth. This is Savishesh. So you see this Savishesh word means Savishesh with Vishesh and Vishesh means Avashesh. Sa, uh, sa vishesh. So avishesh or avashesh it means the remainder. So if karani is the square of the side by one, divkarani is the measure of diagonal and here we find the square root of 2. So this uh, you know uh, undeciphered or uh, difficult Sanskrit shlokas going even further back from Pythagoras' theorem 
has taught us to calculate geometry and the value of square root of 2 but these are so difficult that only the pundits or the elite class knew Sanskrit and was not possible for ordinary mortals to decipher them and hence it remained uh, something hidden. Bodhyayana further went and discovered the Pythagorean theorem, the circle of the square and the value of pi. So this is another version which I found. I don't know whether it is right or wrong because the previous version I have taken from a very authentic book of my father. My father uh, gave that book and told me this is where it is originally written. So Samasvadvikarena Pramanam Tritena Vardayet and it seems more or less the uh, verses to be the same. Sama means square. Dvikarani is the diagonal. Pramanam means unit measure. Tritena Vardayet increased by third. Atma is itself. And Chaturthisma Savishes means is an excess by the 34th part. So we see on overall that the Greeks uh, around 400 and 400 BC, uh, BC uh, that square roots of positive whole numbers that are not perfect square are always irrational numbers. This is the Euclid's theorem we know dating back to 400 BC. The particular case square root of 2 is assumed to date back earlier to the Pythagorean which is exactly the length of the diagonal of a square of side of length 1. Then we find Chinese mathematicians around 200 BC who worked on what is called excess and deficiency which says to combine the excess and deficiency as the divisor and the numerator multiplied by the excess denominator and the excess numerator times the deficiency denominator combine them becomes the dividend. We also saw that Mahavira around 800 gave AD gave the square root of a negative number which does not exist. And then in 1450, the symbol of our square root was invested by Regio Montanus and an R was used for radix to indicate square roots. And finally, Christoph Rudolf in this book, as you can see right on your screen, the symbol of square root was first used in 1525. And this is an excerpt from the book, which you can see right at the last line, how the square root of 2 is being used. Coming to the last part which is the exponential uh, in mathematics exponential we all know a multiplied by a times a times a give rise to a to the power n and uh, it is denoted a uh, to the power 2 it is denoted as a2 in logic we denote it as and so a and b is true if and only if a is true and b is true an operand of a conjunction we know is called an operand so we say p joe it's maggie and q mary drinks soda so we call p and q but hold on here is also a point of attention this is an exponential and this is a logical and right so you see there is a difference those who are aware about using the symbols in equations uh, it can be latex or uh, you know symbols in uh, ms word you will see these are not the same sign so just as dot product and the circle one which is the composite function are not the same the exponential and the logical and are not the same you see the exponential is a less and the logical one is a bigger one so that's it i think that we have covered the basic arithmetic operators and the uh, history behind that who invented and what are the usages and the common frequent uh, confusions which arises from the sign so the next video i would be covering on equality equivalence and similarity this is equally interesting and it carries fascinating stories greek hieroglyphics and lot of other things which i'm sure you are going to enjoy so i would wait for your comment because this is a new series which i'm starting do comment do like do subscribe and please let me know how did you liked it and i would be coming up with the next video on this particular arithmetical symbols and this will going on there are a lot of symbols and there are a lot of hidden and great histories which are we are in due process of time we are going to explore so I am so happy that the pandemic is slowly getting over as far as India is concerned. The schools are opening up, the children are going out, the sun is out and everything is going back to normal. I wish you, you all stay safe and happy wherever you are and whatever do it, you are doing. Stay safe, stay happy and wish you a great weekend ahead. Bye.